So again, this week I'll be using the visuals to uh, help with this. Uh, at least I hope that it helps. And if it doesn't, then I don't know that I can do anything about that at this point because it's the only plan I got. Uh, today our, our uh, title is uh, Creativity and Process. Just to review, we spent a couple of weeks talking about the uh, creation stories, the two creation stories from Genesis. We spent last week talking about wonder and how wonder connects to our comprehending creation and uh, wonder as a key component of worship. And uh, next week, I'll just give you a teaser, uh, we're going to be talking about creativity and art. And instead of a sermon, we're going to be having sort of a a meditation, a dialogue uh, with uh, four of us. Uh, Myself, uh, Vicki Cheatwood, uh, our writer and uh, author, uh, Joan Hogue, painter and uh, visual artist, Ron Bobbitt. Somewhere I saw right up here, Ron Bobbitt, musician and composer. And we're going to be talking about what it means to be creative and how God works through our creativity. I think it's going to be very interesting. So that's next Sunday. But... Today is just theology. It's just about theology. And uh, my goal in uh, 15 or 20 minutes is to give you an introduction to something called process theology and how it relates to creativity. I hope to hopelessly, uh, uh, not hopelessly bore you and uh, ask your general forgiveness if I go too quickly or if none of this makes any sense whatsoever, which is entirely possible. Uh, It's not an easy theology to explain because it started off as a philosophy. It started out as the thought of these two guys, uh, Charles Hartshorn on the left and uh, uh, Whitehead, Alfred North uh, Whitehead on the right. And so it's pretty heady. Uh, It was given theological feet by all sorts of people, including this guy. Maybe somebody, uh, maybe some of you remember him, uh, Schubert Ogden from uh, Perkins. Uh, I got no recognition of that slide. It scares me a little bit. You do... (laughs) You do remember Schubert, right? You know, it's interesting, by the way, this is just has nothing to do with anything. There are no Google images of Schubert Ogden face anywhere. I don't know what that means. I, I believe that it might mean he's removed them. But, uh, and I believe that if anyone had the power to do that, he might. But anyway, he was an interesting character and, uh, and a great theologian for a whole generation of uh, students. The reason I thought it would be a good idea to talk about process theology is, to me, it's fundamentally and absolutely connected to creativity. And whether you realize it or not, it's been a part of many, many sermons I've preached here, whether I've ever mentioned that term or not. And finally, I like to say, and I mean this pretty literally, that without process theology, it would be very hard for me to believe in God. And I know that sounds crazy, but... When we say this phrase of not having to check your brain at the door, you know, you, you like, we like to say that here. Process theology was the thing that allowed me to take my brain along. And it's helped me to understand many, many things in theology, like the Trinity, best as you can understand the Trinity. When I talk about God and the word God or the first person of the Trinity, all those are sort of connected. And that's sort of what I mean today, at least in my own mind. Uh, That may not be the way it plays out for some, but it is the way it plays out for me. Process theology gets at some fundamental questions. What is God like in God's self? Uh, What is God in God's self? What is the world like? Who are we? And to jump to the end and give you the punchline early, the point is that creativity is the truth about the nature of reality, and God is connected to all creativity. That's the bottom line, and we'll come back to that as we go along. The world, all of us, all creatures, we're all changing, all growing, all evolving, and God is a part of each and every moment of that happening. But to get there, we must first acknowledge that some of the older ideas about God, maybe they don't work. Traditional theology and spiritual seekers have said certain things about God and said them with great certainty. For generations, for centuries and eons, God is far off in the heavens. God is unchanging. God is absolute. God is transcendent, holy beyond space and time. Not just sort of, but holy beyond space and time. God is omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. God is omniscient, meaning that God knows all things. Of course, the, the, some of these relate to God and God's self, and some of it is about God's power or actions. But these are the things that people have said about God. And, of course, the problem always became that if, 
Uh, Some of you remember this image, don't you? That if God was all these things, how do we ever know God? How do we ever experience God? If God is just way up there in the clouds, beyond all time and space, what good is that? There's an old preacher story about a girl praying at night, saying her prayers to her mother. And her mother says, well, is that good? Does that make you feel any better? And the little girl says, well, yeah, it was okay. But sometimes I think I need a God with a little skin on it. Process theology tries to bridge that gap between the transcendent God and the eminent God. And this is one of the places where traditional theology often fails people because people feel and sense and experience God's presence. It's not that you don't, right? You do in your life often experience it. We said last week of how we often experience God, uh, God's Holy Spirit in nature and through other people. So then you run up against this idea of God being a holy other and, and out there, and it just doesn't make any sense for people. And so some people go the other direction. Some people begin to say that they only see God in the world, period. That God is just the, the rocks and the trees and the creatures. The big $64 million theological world for this is pantheism. To some people, God is just the world. That's it. Nothing, nothing more. But that doesn't seem very satisfying either, really. So what to do with the extremes? Transcendent or worldly, absolute or relative, way off in heaven or a part of the goodness of the earth. Process theology says to this, yes. It's not either or, it's both and. It's not either or, it's both and. God is both transcendent and imminent. God is both beyond the world and within the world. God is spirit, but also in some sense, God is matter. God is absolute, absolutely absolute. But God is also relative. God is unchanging, but also God is changing. This is the part that really bugs some people. How is it that we can say that God is changing? Well, the reality of reality is always changing. Nothing is ever fixed. Physicists have been telling us this for decades now, yes? We get this idea in our minds that things don't change, that everything is static. And that's sort of both true and false. Most of the time, the changes that happen happen so quick, uh, so slowly, rather, that we can't really see them happening. Like the seasons changing themselves. You don't really see it as it's happening. But reality itself is made up of moment after present moment. The you that you were when you came in the room a little while ago is different than the you you are now. Some of your cells are different than they were when you came in here. And by analogy, we say that the same process holds true for God. Let me use myself as an example, if I may. And this is just because this, I was the only person I had permission to do this for. <laughs> Here's how I started out. I started out as a little loaf of bread. Isn't that cute? <laughs> little Company of Mary's Hospital in Torrance, California. But as you can see, I've changed quite a bit. Wasn't I an adorable kid? Look at that guy. Can you be- look at that haircut? Isn't that something? Now, look at this, uh, look at this uh, high school. Look at the hair on that guy. And look at the serious college student, the seminary graduate. Now, this is a little embarrassing, this next one, the, uh, the young preacher. Boy, look at those glasses there. Now, look at the hair on this guy. Man, I am so jealous of that guy. And I started to lose some of that hair, and then you sort of get to one that was relatively close. I can remember being that kid. That kid was me. And I still have a sense that I was that kid. I have been me at every moment in all of those pictures you ever saw. And I have this continual experience of always being me. And that's the same for you, too, yes? You have this experience of always being yourself at any given point. And yet, in another and profound sense, you have always been changing. 
Well, what we say, well, by the way, this is just a little reference. This is me a couple of weeks ago, and that's me when I came here to North Haven. A couple of weeks ago, here at North, uh, I blame you all for that, by the way. (laughs) No, it's a part of that same process. It's a part of that same process. The point is, it's the same for you too. You have always been you at every moment, but you have always been changing. Well, by analogy, it's the same for God. There is some part of God that's always God. Absolute. Absolutely absolute and unchanging. But, and and to say that God is transcendent is also absolutely true. But God is also imminent incarnational, present in the world, in and moving through all things. God is beyond all things and within all things. If God is God, it must be so. Our friend Bill McIlvaney once said about God, God is not you and not me and not all of us put together. And I want to emphasize this a little bit, that God is not just you. God is not just me. And God is not just all of us put together. You see, the analogy of the body might help. We are more than the sum of our parts. Yes, we are, more, we are not just individual cells. We are not just DNA or hands or feet or ears or noses. The body functions as this amazing whole, greater than the sum of its parts. And yet even describing the whole doesn't really get at it because we're changing all the time. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. We are always ourselves. We are always changing. The fancy $64 million word for this is panentheism. It's more than saying God is the trees or the rocks. But it's saying that just like our bodies, just like our personhood, the sum of God is greater than the parts themselves. There is a mysterious whole. So, what about these ideas of time? And how everything, even God, is constantly changing. These mean some pretty mind-blowing things about some of these other theological statements. And this is where it really gets challenging for some people. We say that God is omniscient, which of course means knowing all things. We say that God is omnipotent, which means, of course, having all power. But the question, and you know this question, it's a question that has been asked for centuries is how can God have a plan for everything and have all the power if we still have free will? How can our free will be free? Well, maybe it turns that we have sort of misunderstood these words, omniscient and omnipotence. My favorite Charles Hartshorn book is called Omnipotence and Other Theological Mistakes. I just like the title. I, I really like to read the book, but... But God created us truly free. Our free will is real. It is not an illusion or a trick. What we do, how we behave in the world matters. What we decide at any given moment matters. There is a, that is a part of what determines the future history of our lives and of the world. And this has meaning for how we say that God knows all things or has all power. God does know all things and have all power. Just everything except for one thing, what's going to happen next? 